to her and said, Mommy, no Lego up nose, no Lego up nose. And she thought, what? And she set her son up and looked up his nose and saw the color of a Lego way up his nose. And she said, what do you do? Do you get mad at the kid or do you laugh? So anyway, she's in this dilemma. So her Thanksgiving meal, she's preparing the meal, totally interrupted, had to put that on hold, went to the emergency room. The docs there got a little chuckle as they extracted the Lego from the boy's nose. Everything was fine. They got home and, and the dad distracted the little boy while, while mom went and gathered up all the Legos in the house and deposited them in the trash can. But sometimes there are interruptions that you just cannot possibly plan for. And we're going to talk today about those untimely holiday interruptions that can potentially irritate us. I mean, the phone rings right before you're walking out the door to do your last minute Christmas shopping or bad weather comes and it cancels the program. Our relatives come for dinner and they stay a week. The car breaks down, has a flat tire, and you have the trunk filled with presents that you've got to pull out before you can change the, the tire. The, uh, the, the flight leaves early or gets canceled. You go for a quick trip to, to Walmart and you're there for an hour because you see the whole church there and you got to talk before you get out. Or your child puts a Lego up its nose. If you're a stay-at-home mom, your life is one interruption after another. I mean, kids fall and get hurt, appliances break. You plan to put the kids down for a nap, but your husband calls and says, hey, can you do a last-minute errand for me? And all day long, it's, hey, Mom! Or people stop by and say, you know, I didn't have anything to do, so I thought I'd stop by and visit with you. And you think, why is it that people have nothing to do? Stop by and they want to do it with me. <laughs> Some interruptions are minor and they're over in minutes. There are other interruptions that can impact you for a lifetime and they last forever. And our lives, particularly I think during the holidays, are filled with untimely interruptions. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, you do not know what a day may bring forth. And it's true for all of us. Interruptions are just part of our daily event. And how you handle interruptions, especially during the holidays, can help determine your success or your failure or your joy or your despair or your positive example for Christ or your negative one. So in this sermon, we're going to look at... Uh, a day, a particular day in the life of Jesus that was one interruption after another in Matthew chapter 14. And in fact, we're going to learn from Jesus how he handled regular interruptions. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, the Bible says that when Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Now this was the day that Jesus was out teaching and he learned that, that John the Baptist, his friend, was killed by Herod. And here he is in the midst of his busy day when he learns this news. So I want to look at this first point about how Jesus experienced constant interruptions during his life in ministry. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin and he was his co-worker in ministry. And Jesus had to have been grieved by this terrible news, this untimely news that his cousin had been killed. And since this came at a time when Jesus had a busy day, he decided to get away from the crowds and to go and to mourn by himself. So he went, the Bible says, and he got into a boat. So here the, the ministry of Jesus was interrupted by this bad news. And then Jesus' solitude was interrupted by the crowd. There was apparently a lookout on the hillside watching Jesus get into the boat, instructing the crowds to where Jesus was about to land. And verse 14 of our text in Matthew 14 says, Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. Jesus was looking for privacy, but when he got out of the boat, there were all these people going, Here we are! We're over here! Is this a bad time? And, you know, you got relatives like that that come, and they might stay for an entire week, kind of like Chevy Chase, you know, on, on, on that Christmas movie that he's in, and the relatives come. But Jesus didn't resent this intrusion. Verse 14 says, the Bible says this, that he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. 
So here Jesus turned this interruption into an opportunity to do ministry. Instead of being upset at their insensitivity when he was warning, he used that as an occasion to do ministry. In fact, this is the occasion where he feeds the 5,000, one of the most popular uh, miracles that Jesus did by transforming a child's lunch into to feeding a whole group of people. So when we study the life of Christ, you find that he did that a lot. He turned these interruptions into opportunities to express God's glory and God's healing. Just think about the miracles that Jesus did as a result of an interruption. On one occasion, he was at a wedding reception, enjoying the moment. And uh, mom comes to Jesus and said, look, they're out of wine. Can you do something? And Jesus takes that occasion to do his, performs his first miracle and changes gallons of water into wine. Then on another occasion, during this exhausting day preaching, Jesus tried to catch a cat nap in the bottom of the boat when he and the disciples were going across the sea and the storm wells up and the disciples interrupt Jesus' cat nap and say, can you do something? The storm's going to kill us. And Jesus wakes up and he, he calms the storm and the disciples are amazed at his authority over the storm. There's an occasion when Jesus is preaching in this in this house and it's so crowded that people couldn't get in and people had brought their friend who was disabled to be healed by Jesus and they couldn't get through the doorway. And they, cl they climb up on the rooftop and they dig through this thatch roof and lower their friend down on a mat right in front of Jesus when he's teaching. Now that would be disruptive <laughs> if somebody would come through that roof. But Jesus took that time to heal the fellow, to forgive his sins and to affirm to those that were onlookers, uh, uh, affirm his deity. Jesus was about to teach a large crowd on another occasion when Jairus, a synagogue ruler, came to him and said, my 12-year-old daughter's about to die, can you come help? So Jesus was interrupted here when he was teaching and decides to go and heal Jairus' daughter. The Bible says in Luke 8, 42, that as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. While Jesus was on his way after being interrupted, he goes and is about crushed by the crowds when he's interrupted again by this lady who had this blood disorder. And Jesus stops. So here there's an interruption within the interruption. And Jesus stops yet again and says, who touched me? And the disciples are saying, what do you mean who touched you? We're about to be crushed here, Jesus, and we got to go to Jairus' daughter. What are you doing? He said, no, somebody touched me. I feel the healing has left my body. Who touched me? And he waited until this woman revealed herself. And Jesus ministered to her and affirmed to her and healed her. And, and right in the midst of that, Jairus' servants came to him and said, look, it's too late. Your daughter's died. In fact, they say to him, don't bother the teacher anymore. Because they knew they were interrupting Jesus. And Jesus turned that interruption into a time of healing. Verse 50 of, of Luke 8 says, don't be afraid. Jesus says to Jairus, just believe and she'll be healed. And Jesus goes in to Jairus' home, bypassing all the mourners, all of those who believe it's too late. And he heals Jairus' daughter and affirms the glory of God. All because Jesus responded favorably to all of those interruptions. In fact, Kim Blanchard said if it wasn't for interruptions in Jesus' ministry, he wouldn't have had a ministry. So I want to see that Jesus' example helps us to learn how to handle those daily disruptions that could really erupt us sometimes. So let's look at some lessons on how we can handle those regular interruptions in our lifetime, especially during this hectic time of the, of the holiday season. And the first point I think that we can learn is plan interruption-free zones. Plan time where you can not experience an unwelcome interruption. I think some of the reason we get so exasperated at interruptions is we cram pack so much activity into our days, especially during the holidays. And if anything comes up into that and interrupts us, we're just kind of spent. I mean, we get so emotionally and physically and mentally and spiritually drained. In verse 13, it says, Jesus withdrew by a boat to a private place. On this occasion, he tried to get away, but he couldn't. But a few verses later, after Jesus addressed the crowd, we read in verse 23 that says, After he dismissed the crowd, 
he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all alone. Jesus eventually and intentionally got away to be with the Father to mourn, a time that he had alone just to pray to grieve the death of his friend, that untimely news of the death of his friend. But look at these examples of Jesus, what he did on other occasions. In Mark chapter 1, it says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. John 6 says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. Luke 5, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. There's an old Indian proverb that says, you will break the bow if you keep it always bent. And if you always continue to pack so much into your daily schedule, when that interruption comes, you are going to snap. That's why from the beginning, God instructed that we were to work six days and we we're to take the seventh day and make it a day of rest. God, for the Hebrew people, scheduled six feast periods during the year where they could rest. They didn't plant in the fields every seventh year so they could rest during that time. God designed it for people, for us, to take breaks, to rest, to get away. And one of the problems with busy people is that they say, well, you know what, I need to get this done right now. Like, you know, I can rest a little bit later. And they get exhausted. And when the interruption comes, they snap. And we often snap at those people that are closest to us. And one of the best things that we can do, especially if the schedule's tight, is to build in some flex time. I listened to a conference speaker once that said we got to develop hang time. Time where we can just hang out and be with our friends. He said, we're so busy at times, we can't even do good things for the people that we care about the most. And if you're too busy, that interruption when it comes is likely to erupt you. Somebody has made an acrostic for uh, busy, being, being under Satan's yoke. And if all you do is activity after activity after activity, maybe you're under Satan's yoke. And maybe you need to evaluate what is going on with your life. And maybe you need to make a time during the year where you get away for several days. And you put away that cell phone. You put away that computer. And you recharge your spiritual batteries. That's why I think that when sometimes when you go on a mission trip or a spiritual retreat, that that is so refreshing at times. Why is it? Because you... You get away from those normal things during the day and you're with people that pray and it's, it's such a spiritual time to recharge. And I think we need to take a page out of that and apply it even to our vacations. There are times when I've gone on vacation that they're so packed that my prayer time and, and spiritual time is interrupted and... We need to make those opportunities during the year when we can get away and get spiritually recharged and refreshed. And then when the interruption comes, you're going to likely be able to handle that better. And there are times just during every day where we need to set time apart to where we can kind of recharge a little bit. And uh, it's okay to close your door and not to answer the phone every time that, that the thing rains. I mean, every day we need to set a, a part of some time where we can be focused. Jesus was not always available. He went to solitary places where he knew that he would be alone. And by the way, if you're a stay-at-home mom, get a babysitter sometimes or put the kids down for a nap for five hours or something. There was one lady who had her third child and she wrote a thank you note to her friends and said, many thanks for the playpen. I use it every day from two to three. I get in it and read and the kids can't get near me. <laughs> Plan some interruption free zones where you can recharge a little bit. A second lesson I think we can learn from Jesus is we need to determine the nature of the interruption. Verse 14 said, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd, and he had compassion on them. Another gospel writer says that he saw them as sheep that didn't have a shepherd. And it's important to note that Jesus didn't respond immediately 
to every interruption that came his way. On one occasion, Jesus received word that Lazarus, his friend, Mary and Martha, had sent word that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus didn't respond immediately to that. In John chapter 11, verse 6, we read that, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed, Jesus stayed, where he was two more days. He didn't respond immediately. And by the time he made the journey back, Lazarus had been dead four days. And the sisters were saying, why? What happened? But Jesus was able to use that opportunity then to heal Lazarus and to glorify God. But not all interruptions are God's call on your life. Jesus was in high demand, but he didn't respond immediately. And there are some interruptions that you need to evaluate. Some need to be delayed. Some need to be avoided. And some need to be ignored. Nehemiah in the Old Testament was building, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And there were some critics that said, hey, we want you to come down and have this conference, to have this meeting. And he writes back to them and he says, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. And he did not stop what he was doing. Andy Stanley wrote a book called Choose to Cheat. And he said, you can't say yes to everything. So don't cheat the people and things that are most important. In your life you can't respond to every interruption so you got to be discerning sometimes when that interruption comes am I going to respond to that or am I going to reject it or delay it or not regard it you know a friend says hey let's take the afternoon off and go Christmas shopping well maybe that's the right thing to do but maybe you need to stay at work and get that project done or somebody near you at work starts to gossip. Well, you know, you shouldn't listen to that, but maybe you get a Facebook alert or a text or an email. And you know, it's fun to respond to that and check that out, but maybe you need to delay that to a little bit later on during the day. If you got five people waiting on you and you're going to have this meeting coming up and you get a phone call right before that meeting, Somebody has a great need, it might be time to say, you know what, it sounds like a very important need, and I tell you, can I call you back later on in the day? And you hang up, and you go to your meeting on time, because it's disrespectful to make five people wait on you because somebody interrupted you, and you didn't handle that as well as you could. But there, on the other hand, I think are some interruptions that will provide a greater opportunity than the one that you already had previously scheduled. You know, I, uh, I've, it's been an adjustment for me being a dad. I mean, I was 41 when I got married, and uh, now I've got two young kids. And before kids, when I was married, probably like any preacher, if you came home over my house at night, you'd find me out back praying and reading the Bible for hours on, on the back porch. No, no, not exactly that. But you'd find me, you know, I'd be hanging out with the guys at the gym till late. And, uh, I'd be washing the car, you know, well into the night, things that I don't do anymore because, you know, being married and having a family. And uh, there are things that just happen differently. Well, I, uh, I've got this beautiful four-year-old daughter, and uh, the other night I came in and, and had some time and I knew I was going to be able to catch up on the news and I walked in and I thought boy this is great I'm going to watch some news and uh, Gab said to me daddy play tic-tac-toe with me she just learned how to play tic-tac-toe so you know I don't know if it's because she just got such a cute smile or because I have a greater sense of responsibility now or maybe because I thought I could be a four-year-old at tic-tac-toe, I, instead of watching the news, I got down on the floor and, and I played tic-tac-toe and taught my four-year-old some lessons on losing. And, uh, no, we had a good time. But that interruption deepened our relationship. And, and you know, she might remember that for, for some time to come. But Ephesians 5 says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Be discerning. When that interruption comes, it might be proved to be a greater occasion than what you already had planned. And here's another lesson. The third one, point C. Give full attention to the interruption. When you look at the life of Jesus, when the interruption came, he gave full attention 
to the person or that someone who interrupted him. That woman touched his garment, the hem of his garment. He knew power had left him. And he said, who is it that touched me? And he waited and she identified herself and he ministered and focused and gave full attention to that interruption at hand. And he wanted her to understand the purpose for her healing. And you know, sometimes when we get interrupted, what do we do? We give partial attention. Somebody's talking to us and we're trying to catch a look at the clock or they're talking and we're thinking about our schedule that's coming up and we just give partial attention to that. Haven't you ever talked on the phone and you're still checking your email or checking Facebook or something and, and they're saying, they're talking to you, pouring out their heart and they're saying, are you on the computer? You say, no, I'm just taking notes of our conversation. <laughs> Counseling here. Studies have shown that multitasking is not as effective as we sometimes think. We and James even talked about passive attention, that, that we do better when we give ourselves wholeheartedly to whatever it is that we're, we're focused on. It's, it doesn't help us to, to do something when our mind is elsewhere. I was greeting people just two weeks ago out here, and I was shaking this guy's hand, and there was somebody behind him I wanted to talk to, and they were kind of getting my attention. And you know, I was doing one of these things. And man, Kevin Steenbergen, he yanked me back. He said, you look at me when I'm shaking your hand. <laughs> I said, okay, Kevin, no problem. <laughs> when you're talking to somebody, and you're going to give full attention to the person that's in front of you. Jim Elliott said, wherever you are, be all there. And you get the impression that where Jesus was, when that interruption came, he was all there. Then fourthly, make the most of every interruption. It might be a divine opportunity. You can transform that interruption into an opportunity to serve. I mean, when you pack too much into every day, you're likely kind of to resist the interruption or resist the God nudge that might come your way. You ever get that thought, you know, I need to speak to that person and you ignore it because there's too much to do. It might be that you need to be interrupted because God is affording you some opportunity to give glory to Him. Colossians 3 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as, as working for the Lord, not for men. It's the Lord Christ you're serving. That means you can envision your daily routine, your daily schedule, and think, I want God to be involved with that. I want God to be able to interrupt me. I want God to be able to use those opportunities for occasion for me to speak up and give Him the glory sometime. And if you view your life as an assignment of God, and an interruption is an opportunity for God. You will then be able to see those interruptions for what they are at times. Maybe divine opportunities. Maybe that unexpected phone call is a phone call that God has ordained to allow you to offer somebody some encouragement. And maybe that traffic delay that it, you're so frustrated with is an opportunity to actually hear the music that's coming through, the praise music that's on your, your radio for God to message you something. And maybe that, hey, mom, is actually an opportunity that your child will remember for days to come. Or that missed flight may turn out to be a positive opportunity. Instead of resenting the intrusion, allow for that opportunity that, hey, you know what? This might be a God opportunity. Um, there's a few weeks ago, the Cary Pregnancy Center had their annual fundraiser dinner. And uh, Bruce Wilkinson was scheduled to speak, and I had, I had registered to go to that event a lot, you know, a couple of months ago. And uh, as that event neared the schedule, I mean, it was right smack around the holidays starting, and, and Rake Up Pueblo then ended up falling on that morning, and I had a, a bad cold at the end of that week, and I thought, you know... I know Bruce Wilkinson and the Caring Pregnancy Center. Bruce Wilkinson's written the Prayer of Jabez bestseller. He wrote uh, recently The God Pocket, which talks about these spiritual nudges that God gives to us. Not like the, the hearing, but on Friday I was pretty stopped up, and Barb Musso, the director, called me. I was scheduled to pray for that event. And she said, Hey, you want to pray? And she said, You sound kind of bad. I'm like, Yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to go work at Pueblo and work with me there. And uh, she said, i tell you what, too, uh, I wanted to call you and let you know that uh, can you come an hour and a half early? I'm like, what for? She said, you know, you can come and meet Bruce Wilkinson and just kind of, there's about 20 people there, and you can talk to him. 
I mean, this is the first night we're going to have a babysitter for the two kids. We've never done that before. And uh, so now we're calling, can you come early? And so we decided to take that interruption and try to make the most of every opportunity. So we went early and, and walked into the room where uh, everybody was meeting there. And I'm standing there talking to somebody, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked up, and, and Bruce Wilkinson said, Hi, I'm Bruce Wilkinson. And I said, Yeah, I'm uh, Greg, Greg Smith, a preacher at the Oasis. And, you know, here Bruce is tapping me on the shoulder. And uh, he pointed out, Hey, you got the same kind of suit I, I have on you. Are you the preacher that's praying for the event? I said, Yeah, you know, preachers wear the same kind of clothes. And, and we talked, and he spoke. Well, then we go into the banquet there, and... Uh, we sat down, and, and there, Barb had seated us right next to Bruce. In fact, I don't know why she didn't sit me next to Bruce. She seated my wife next to Bruce, and I was there. And that, it was nice having you know dinner with him. And, and uh, when he reached, when he leaned across the, the table, and he said, "So, Greg, how are you going to grow the oasis next year?" He had my attention. And when he went on to say, "Well, let me tell you how." He had the whole table's attention. And then when Barb got up to introduce Bruce and start the program, Bruce was still talking to me about how to have a, a good vision for the Oasis. And everybody in the room was watching Bruce at that time. And you know, we left that night so excited uh, about uh, having talked with him and having heard him speak. And, and we were close to not doing that because I had crammed so much activity into that night's event. The Bible says this, that Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And we're going to offer a time in just a moment where you can respond to the message of Christ how God wants you to live your life for Him. And there are probably, you guys sitting out here, I mean, you got to be freezing. I mean, I'm preaching and I'm cold. To think, you know what, I just can't wait to get out of here and get warm. But God wants you to stop just for a moment and allow Him to interrupt our thoughts. In fact, would you close your eyes right now? Father, we welcome your interruption on our life, and I know we might be uncomfortable physically, and I do not know how the devil can work in all of this, but I pray that you would interrupt our routine at the moment and impress upon our minds your desire for our life, that we live it for you, that we can yield right now. There might be those who wanted to respond to you and say, I want to start living for God tomorrow. But today is the day of salvation. I pray that you would interrupt our lives so that we could see your creativity. That, you, that we could see how you communicate to us. And that we could see the cross with all of its meaning that you've packed in purposefully with that. I pray that we could respond to that message this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up, stand up.